Hello, I am Claudia Morales from the Music Division of the Library of Congress, and I'm here with my colleague Anne McLean. We are super excited to welcome to our digital stage Grammy award-winning third coast percussion, Davis Kidmore, Robert Dillon, Peter Martin, and Sean Connors. We also have electronic music producer and composer Jaylene Petten. We are here to talk about their collaborative project, Metamorphosis, that features street dance choreography and dance from Movement Art Is, and music from Philip Glass, Tayonda Braxton, and Jaylin. Also joining us this, in this conversation is composer Gemma Peacock, who will talk about her world premiere, The Three Hole We Cross With Our Closed Eyes, composed for third coast percussion and paired in this virtual performance. This fantastic virtual concert celebrates our Founders Day 2021. Thank you so much and welcome to the library. We are delighted to have you here with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank it's you. Great to be here. So let's take it from the top. We are we have so many questions. This project is just amazing. So from the music perspective, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you started the project with Philip Class Metamorphosis. And along the along the side, you start working with Jalen, who comes to Chicago for a residence, start working with your percussion instruments, goes back home, creates and composes this electronic piece, show it to you, and you'll have to translate these electronic sounds for acoustic percussion instruments. Did I get it right? All right. So please, please explain this process to us. Just from reading about it, feel like a lot of work. So how, how did it happen? And you can all team in and, and, and share with us. Sure, maybe I'll get started and then and then Jaylen, you could you could tell a little bit from your side of things. Um, sure. We the members of, of Third Coast, we came to know Jaylen's music uh, actually uh, several years ago now from reading about it, I think in Pitchfork magazine first. Um, just sort of, you know, we're uh, performing musicians, but we're also music fans and we're always looking for new music that uh, excites and sort of inspires us. And we found uh, a review for Jalen's uh, album, Dark Energy, which is this amazing, amazing uh, piece of work. Um, and listened to it. And not only do we love it, but we said, hey, you know, she uses a lot of percussion sounds <laughs> and she sounds like she would write it a really amazing piece for third coast percussion and uh and so you know as time went on we reached out and we we got to know uh jay lynn and um talked about putting a project together so in some ways um jay lynn you were kind of the beginning of this whole project because it started with saying um we have to work with this incredible musician um and then yeah claudia what you described is basically how the project came to be once we started uh, putting uh, putting it all together. Um, Jalen, you came to our studio and I think you spent like two full days sampling our entire instrument collection with Sean. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, it, you know, it's so funny because actually it probably wasn't anywhere close to the whole thing. <laughs> but for sure, definitely um, Sean and I had a ball those two days. <laughs> And um, yeah, it, 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 no, you all's collection is, it's, first of all, it's constantly growing. And then, but what I, I did was I sampled like the basics of, um, so like the marimba, like we literally, it, it was about, a, about an eight, nine hour day of just going through every note of like wow. the marimba, the vibraphone, just <laughs> everything. It was, it was, it was a lot. And making sure also too, like with, trying to make sure that getting the clarity of each sound, getting the clarity of each note, and then kind of contending with like, like, you know, just outside interference <laughs> and, you know, having to record right at the perfect moment. It was like, this, this is one funny portion. Um, Sean and I are doing the, um, the bowls where you have to like the, the I forget, like the meditation bowls. And it's every time, Sean went to touch the bowl. It was either like a car, a train, <laughs> something. 
So, but you know, we got it, we, we got it done. And then we got it within that, two, those two days. And I went back and I started, you know, just first, I'm just, just listening to the sounds first. For me, it's always about feeling a thing. So I have to feel the sounds first. Then I begin to, you know, then I may begin to write or just kind of, you have to get to know, at least for me, I have to get to know, you know, each sound, especially when it's new, because it's like now it's like a member of the family of like of my, you know, what my sound library is. And yeah, we did. We got um, got that done. And then I began to create the pieces. And as I made them, um, I sent them, I, 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 I you know, I, I sent them out and I would send them um, to uh, David and, you know, he would play it you know, for, for, for the, for the guys. And, it, and, you know, it just, we, it was just kind of like from there, we, um, it was very family. It also helps like for me, third coast is very family. So it's, it's, it's so nice just to be around, you know, they're just great beings. Like mm -hmm. they're all gems, you know, the whole, you know, third coast team is, they're really the gems. So it's, I would hope that we could do this <laughs> again, you know, at some point because they are they're they're amazing. Jalen, did you have before going into the studio uh, for the resonance? Do you have an idea of the sounds that you were looking for, the instruments that you were uh, going to try out, or the textures that you were looking for, or was it like a just a creativity flowing from that moment? Well. Me being, me also being making music with, I'm very percussion as well. So just being familiar with just the instrument alone is, was, you know, super helpful. I already knew what I, you know, kind of had an idea of what I was going into. So I was like, oh, okay, you know, and then it was just a matter of, um, you know, let me, you know, putting, you know, like my spin on a thing or making it um, uh, is, you know, being as, I guess, as creative as I possibly could. Um, and so it was, it was just a matter of, yeah, I knew exactly, I mean, not exactly, but I would say for the most part, I knew, you know, what I was walking into. And it was great because I love, um, like, just if, I, if I'm using the right term, like, just tr like acoustic traditional percussion quite a bit. And I use it a lot especially more so now lately than I would even say before my, like than my first album, for sure. It's such a, I have such a great appreciation for it. And you, you've written for percussion before. So this is, as you said, this is new to us. Do, but do you, in this process, do you learn something different? Do you, in terms of the sound, when you mm -hmm. heard them playing your, mm -hmm. your sounds and their instrument with their take, did mm -hmm. you learn something different? Did you discover something different about this composition? Oh, absolutely. It was a totally different feel at that point. Mm -hmm. from when it went from what I did, then th their interpretation, oh, it was a totally different feel. And I, I loved it. Like, as a, mm -hmm. I, I love unexpected surprises. And so for me, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it just flowed so well. And a lot of that, again, it just has to do with the chemistry of who you're working with and like working with like what TCP is. It is, it's, it's such a, it's a beautiful experience, honestly. And how was the process for the musicians? Oh, I'm sorry, Ann. Go ahead. No, 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 keep on going. How was, how was the other way around? How was for the, for you guys to react, to translate the sounds into your, your instruments? Yeah. It was it was a ton of fun and it was like a, a incredible way to sort of like get inside of Jalen's head a bit more too. <laughs> I mean, um, I think we all really enjoyed like the rhythm of vocabulary and the, um, the sort of unpredictability and uh, density of Jalen's music so much. And it was cool to like, you know, just get to spend time with her, talk about some things, try some things out, listen to tracks together, maybe improvise a little bit. But then when she uh, you know, went away and really created a bunch of tracks in the way that she usually works, sort of putting it together in uh, in a DAW on her computer, and then sent us these things with all of the different layers in there so we could pull out each instrumental sound on its own and see like, okay, here's just what the hi-hat sound is doing. And then, okay, what's this layer? Oh, that's another hi-hat. It's doing something slightly different. And then here's like another hi-hat sound and realizing like, 
there are so many layers in here, like maybe 30, 40, 50 stems in one track. It was, it was pretty mind blowing actually. And it was cool then to sort of realize the levels of unpredictability too, and sort of start to like, as we would figure out how to put this on an instrument say like, oh, I think I see the pattern sort of in this voice and be like, oh, wait a minute. No, she just broke the pattern. Like it's always changing. And that was, it was, it was really inspiring. Um, I think for, for all of us, as we like delved in there and then it was, it was a fun challenge to have to then say like, okay, there's only four of us. How can four live musicians create th recreate this live? And not just understanding like, okay, how many of these voices can one person handle, but also like what elements of this will translate really cleanly onto an acoustic instrument? And then what things are like when we start doing it on a live instrument that doesn't have that like incredible focus, the electronic sounds that and the consistency of them? what translates and what do we have to sort of reimagine in some small ways in order to get the big picture to work out playing it live. But it was, it was, it was a lot of work, but it was a ton of fun. You know, the, the layers of catching onto that word, there's so many layers of collaboration in this incredible piece, mesmerizing piece. And I was wondering how you went about, I mean, first there was a level with working with you, Jalen, and then how you, created the through composed bigger piece for the whole evening length work with the dancers and then adding on first the choreographers, then then a layer for the dancers and then a layer for the lighting and set design, multi, multi, multi layers. How did this develop? Well, we, um, uh, uh, we had worked with the choreographers Movement Art is on a past project uh, with Hubbard Street Dance Chicago, a really wonderful uh, modern dance company in our hometown. They had uh, set movement on, on Hubbard Street Dance and we had uh, created music for that project. So we, we got to know Lil Buck and John both, the two creatives that are at the head of Movement Art is uh, through, through that past collaboration. And as soon as we were working together, similar to working with Jay Lynn and similar to working with Gemma, you just know when you work with someone if it's a good fit and and if you want to work again you know so straight away with with buck and books we knew we wanted to do another project with them uh that was really that was really like squarely focused on their uh style of movement uh with dancers who are deeply uh like steeped in their style of movement um and so we, um, you know, it's uh, it's funny how these projects come together. It's sort of like you say, ah, Jalen's amazing. We want to work with her. Tande Brexton's amazing. We want to work with him. Luke Murder is is great. We want to work with them. And then uh, every now and then, there's there's like a, a central thing that kind of brings all these strings and ties them together. And in this case, the impetus was Carnegie Hall. They reached out to us um, mm -hmm. about doing a, a, a what would have been and I think will be our, uh, our Carnegie Hall debut. Um, and they were specifically interested in a, in a piece with movement. Um, and so we reached out to Movement Art Is and, and started that uh, conversation and brought in Jalen and Tayande. Um, and then in terms of how it all came together, um, it came together during the COVID-19 pandemic. and. Yeah, I wonder if like maybe Sean or Pete, do you want to regale everyone yeah. with the tale of how this came together? Yeah, I mean, you know, originally we were scheduled to do a lot of the um, developing the production was going to be in Seattle uh, over the summer of 2020 um, at the Mini Center, uh, which was also um, uh, helped uh, sort of commission and, and bring about this larger sort of work. Um, then when we realized that it wasn't going to happen in person, um, you know, we had to figure something else out. So we had... The dancers were both in LA as well as Las Vegas, um, working on choreography. We were our, in our studio in Chicago. We had a lighting designer also in Chicago, but not working with us in the same room, but was like in his own office, developing, you know, sort of different scenes for everything. And then we have an amazing um, uh, uh, stage director uh, named Leslie Danzlig, uh, who's Chicago based, um, that we've also worked with in some previous uh, 
previous performances. And um, I think, as you mentioned earlier in, in this conversation, you know, bringing all of these different elements together and finding a way to sort of like seamlessly move from piece to piece and, you know, into something that created more of like an overall sort of like narrative or an overall uh, performance um, is something that's always challenging uh, when you have so many different voices and so many different aesthetics uh, mm -hmm. that, that you're, 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 you're combining. Um, and Leslie really helped us sort of bring that all together by looking at it from a bird's eye view and thinking about like the journey from the beginning of the performance to the very end. But, uh, you know, we, um, we've learned a lot uh, through the course of the <laughs> pandemic in terms of working remotely. And um, this was a huge challenge, but one that, you know, we're really proud of, um, of being able to create a large production, you know, like this um, completely remotely. It's remarkable. And Jalen, you've said that you love, you're in love with movement. So this is, it's a great thing to see your music come to life in this way. Um, I was wondering, I, I saw the, the ballet you did with Wayne McGregor, incredible, incredible movement thing. Um, one other thing, and, and then I'll uh, uh, want to turn this back to Claudia. In terms of the uh, trust, I noticed a comment that Lil Buck made about the level of trust that you need to develop or to feel with anyone to do an artistic collaboration. That was an interesting thing for me to hear about. How, how do you relate to that comment? I feel that I, I totally agree. I also agree too that because when you, when if, if you, if for myself, for an example, if I approach Third Coast, there's a reason I approach Third Coast because mm -hmm. I obviously trust them. So that's being step one. In me trusting them though, that requires that I have to step back and let them create. Mm -hmm. Because if I micromanage, I'm not going to get the best out of them. And I learned that working with Wayne McGregor. And he's the one who told me that he told me, he said, when I was creating for him, I'm not going to micromanage you or I would never do that because I wouldn't get the best out of you. So I learned that was a very turning moment for me and how I, you know, approach things or also when a person approaches me. So that also goes back to like what David was saying with the chemistry, you know, you feel it, you know, when it's going to work and when it's not. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, it like there have been times where I've been at the very beginning of a thing and I'm like, Oh, absolutely. This will not work. <laughs> I love you, <laughs> but this won't work. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's, it's about also, you have to be honest with yourself as an artist, be honest with yourself as, you know, just at first as a person, then artistically, if you know this, if it's not going to work, don't force because it's not going to be its best. Sometimes mm -hmm. you do get moments where it is like two fire moments and then like or it's like a fire and ice and then it works. It's 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 rare, but it, it, it you do get those moments. But sometimes but it's like, you know, both two both parties want to pull each other's hair out. So it's <laughs> it, it does happen. But I would just say if you know, you, it's just about really knowing the, the what you can take and what you can't. And if you know at the beginning, you know, it's not going to work, don't, you know, don't, don't push it. Don't, don't stress yourself out unnecessarily. <laughs> well, while you were writing, did you have the dancers in mind while you were creating? Did you, did you write it in terms with having them in mind? I always write with movement in mind. Always. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. It, it, that is, that is always a goal. That is no matter, I have created an entire ballet piece in my head. I can't dance, but I can see it. Mm. And so I can create just like that. You know, um, when I, I wrote, there was a particular song that I did, actually it was for Wayne, um, was Carbon 12. I have an entire different dan piece, dance piece in my head of what that is and what, what that means uh, for myself. Um, and I, it's like, I don't know who the dancers are, you know, in my head, but I can see the whole movement thing. So I'm always, my, every time I write, it's always um, for the purpose of not just movement. Of course, it could be used in so many different, you know, directions, but movement is, is definitely always like one of my first go-tos because it's, movement is something that you feel. 
And because I create the way I compose, I'm an intuitive composer. So it's something it's always for me is the feeling. How did that impact? You know, how did that make you feel? How did that, you know, what kind of imp impact would it have? And so I operate my one of my mantra is this is what I call CPU clean, precise and unpredictable. So that I'm always in mind with that, you know, as I create. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, along those words, how do you conceive your work in seven movements instead of one longer piece? Oh, I love it. If it were one longer piece, I could I, I could definitely adapt either way. That's what the way that I create is exactly that. I love the duality and the versatility. I love it. And that's why it's great like that. I was so happy that third coast didn't sound like exactly what I did. They picked the <laughs> phrases that they wanted and what they mm. thought worked. And that's what makes it beautiful because it's like, for me, I don't want to hear exactly what I did. I already did that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, give me something else because I've, I've already done that part. Now you do, now you take it and you just rip it apart and do whatever you want to, you know, do with it. That's, that's just how, for me, it, it, it just, I like to, it, it, it's, it's all about, the different interpretation. And, and that's why I call it perspective, the different perspectives of mm -hmm. create creativity and, and, and reaching at your, you know, infinite self and being your, you know, your best self creatively. So, yeah. So um, I, 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 I heard Bach and books talk about um, their, their, their work in this, their, their piece, their creation. And they, for them, they said that street, dance is a way of activism. How is that statement <clears throat> connected to you all? Because there's something that connects you all beyond the, uh, the, the art, beyond the music. How is that statement connecting you and, and, and bringing you all together to do this project? I'll take a stab at that first, if, that, if that's okay. I, one of my favorite things about this project is when you explain it to somebody, most people do a double take and they say, what? There's a classical percussion group that's playing music by Jay Lynn, but also Philip Glass and also Tyande Braxton. And there's going to be incredible street dancers on stage and it's all going to be in communication and speak to each other somehow. And that's, uh, it feels like, um, uh, as artists, that's one of the most important things we can do. We can we can inform each other. We can reach into areas where we're not comfortable or where we don't understand, and we say, "What's awesome about this? What what's inspiring about this? Uh, how can we come together?" And it's you know it's not as direct as, or maybe it's even more direct in some ways, uh, as as going into the, the streets in a protest. But um, uh, you know, people call music the universal language, right? I guess maybe love is too, but <laughs> they go hand in hand and you develop it by doing these projects where um, you come from places that seemingly are so different, um, but uh, immediately have, uh, you, you immediately find the common ground and you, and you, you speak to each other on, on those artistic terms. And the, the, the movement that Buck and Books created are kind, it's kind of like that. It's, it's not necessarily narrative. Um, it's, it's more, um, uh, it's, uh, there's but there's two characters uh and they they come from different dance traditions and very different worlds and if you hear the dancers describe the story that they're dancing they're complete they're completely different but through the course of the work they learn about each other they try out some of each other's moves and then they they uh emerge changed and better for having tried something new i feel sure. like Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I agree. One of the best things to me, my favorite purpose to create is to create in a space that shouldn't make sense. It shouldn't make sense because society tells you we categorize, subcategorize. And for me, that is to put limitation on the thing. I do get, you know, categorizing for reference point, of course. I totally understand that. But what happens is I have learned, I have come to find a lot of times when people don't understand the thing, 
and they can't name it or they can't, it's because they can't, you, or you can't control it in the way. And just it, most people, can, a lot of times people can't enjoy things for the beauty of what it is. No, I can't describe it to you. I have no idea what that was. I just know how it made me feel. And a lot of people, it's like, well, I can't, I don't have a name for it. So, you know, it's not real anymore or it can't be classified. So now it's just, yeah, we throw it to the side. So now it doesn't matter because we can't control it. But for me, I love to create of what things that shouldn't make sense. And honestly, if if you listen to media, this should not make sense. And, and I totally agree with Sean. It, it does. It makes you do a double take. But that's exactly why it works, because all of the arts, I totally agree with Jay-Z when he said that all of the arts are related. Every last one, they're all related. There are no separate this, 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 and this. If it is a cre under a creative space, it's family and no matter what it is. So that's just, you know, that's just how, you know, how I feel, you know, but yeah, I totally agree with, yeah, Sean, for sure. I love something I love about a project like this too, is that it, um, it makes us not just continue to appreciate each of our own backgrounds and our own voices, but it also kind of uh, ties our ties our fates together in a way, you know, like we're, we're co-conspirators uh, or we're, um, you know, <laughs> our, we all want this project to be successful and our, in each of our individual successes are tied to this project being successful. We have this sort of mutual interest in this thing that we want to build together. So it's not just sort of a momentary thing of like, oh yeah, like what Movement Art is does is really cool. Someone just check them out, you know, but it's like, we are now in this thing together and the future of this project is something that we all have like a shared interest in moving forward. And through this, you are reaching incredibly new audiences. Um, I'm, I know I, I've been hearing that's exciting for me. It's exciting for us at the library to be able to put this out and share it as so many presenters have been doing. But for us, it's particularly so because we don't have a chance to do something like this every day. And this is, of course, unique. And also just to say quickly that for the Founders Day um, celebration, the woman who founded our series, Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, was a very visionary person herself who chose to commission both a ballet from Stravinsky in 1928 and then Appalachian Spring in 1944. So I think she would have loved this project with you. You know, um, Jalen, you've said that when you when you have a gift, you have a responsibility to create and reflect the times. And I, this is so much what I see and hear in, in all of this, all of you, from all of you, and from Gemma's work too on, in, on this concert, um, perhaps more than many other ensembles, you are definitively carving this territory. Thank you. So Gemma, your new work, The Threshold We Cross With Our Closed Eyes, composed for third close percussion, is inspired in people's stories. We are just so fascinated by just the idea, people's stories. There are so many stories and how people arrive at, at one particular time. And you mentioned that your research is also based on the li with, the, uh, with the library digital archives. Can you tell us a little bit about all of this process and uh, your inspiration and, and your, your research process at the library. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of funny because the last time I was in a room with all of these people was um, Women's Day in 2020. And we were in DC and I think, was that the premiere of uh, Perspectives? With Yeah, and Jalen's piece just blew me away. Um, and it kind of, I wanted to work with Third Coast and write them a piece for a long time. And I think Sean and I got talking that night and um, he asked me, you know, if I'd be interested. And I was like trying to keep it cool and be like, yeah, yeah, I'd be interested. Um, super like buzzing inside. And he said something about writing for four of the same instruments. Um, and so I took that and discarded it because I was like totally inspired by Jalen's piece and just wanted to use every kind of texture and every kind of... Um, electronic beat um, that I could. And I had all these ideas originally before I found out that the piece was going to, this new piece is going to premiere on Founders Day. 
Um, and honestly, I had to look at what Founders Day is. I've been in the United States for years now, but um, it's not a you know a holiday that we take off. So I, I never really uh, had it explained or looked up what it meant. And to me, um, reading about Founders Day and um, this idea about how America came to be America, it sparked all these different ideas for me about how we create stories and how we, um, you know, myth making and things like that. And I wanted to explore in the Library of Congress's um, amazing and vast uh, resources, other stories about the creation of the United States um, and have a look a little bit wider in terms of whose stories we listen to and whose stories make up the history uh, that, you, you know, we may not get taught in, in school or in textbooks. Um, of course, we've, we're still in this pandemic. So, and I was back in New Zealand where I'm from, so I couldn't uh, access physical items, but the Library of Congress has these amazing collections of uh, digitized archives. Um, so I managed to just start listening to all of the audio uh, files that I could of people talking about their experience of um, moving or being in the United States. Um, so I, I listened to stories from um, people in the Dust Bowl who had been relocated to federal camps. I listened to a lot of stories from formerly enslaved people. Um, and then I expanded out and found um, a lot of Baptist preachers and, uh, you know, lots of different types of Americans and lots of <laughs> uh, people from just incredibly different perspectives because I was channeling Jalen um, so that I could, you know, f explore more about the prismatic uh, background of how, how the United States came to be. Um, and on top of that, I got to do some workshops over Zoom um, with Third Coast and they just, it was super fun, also very strange because we couldn't, well, I couldn't touch anything. So I had to kind of have them be my my hands and um, my brain. So I would just like prompt them for a, um, a sound that I was interested in and they would bring out all the instruments they could think of that could make these kind of weird and um, mystical noises that I was, I was really interested in. Did like you it. also, Go ahead. Sorry, um, the same question I have for Jaylen. Did you also have sounds in mind, textures that you wanted to try out for this piece? How did that work for you? Yeah, I had a lot of sounds um, that I was originally interested in because at the start of the pandemic, I was living in New York and I was worried that um, the borders would get shut down or I wouldn't be able to get back to New Zealand if something happened to my family there. So my husband and I dropped everything and um, left our dog with a friend and went home to New Zealand. And we had to self-isolate. So we went to my husband's parents' place in O'Kane's Bay on the Banks Peninsula in the South Island of New Zealand. And it's this rural valley. Um, and we just, we were transported within 24 hours from Brooklyn to rural New Zealand. Mm. And uh, I had to continue um, working with people online. And I was at the time doing a psychoanalysis and sculpture class at Princeton where I'm doing a PhD. But suddenly I didn't have any materials to do the sculpture side of it. So I would walk up and down the beach and pick up all these bones of animals that had washed up. And I started to like teach myself how to cut, to do bone carving. And every material I had had to be something that I could find because the country went into lockdown and we couldn't go to shops, we couldn't order anything. Um, so I would find like wool and um, clean the wool and make, you know, these kind of sculptures with just organic materials from the environment. And so the first thing that I was really interested in when I was studying this piece with the coast was bone sounds. Um, and I'm really interested in creating music that has a kind of creepy vibe. Um, you know, like it's, it's kind of, I've written a lot of sad music <laughs> and I've tried really hard to write some happy music. Um, but when I've, I've 
recently really just enjoyed writing kind of creepy, scary music, which is its own, it has its own set of challenges and rewards. Um, and so when I started asking Third Coast, um, when we did our first workshop, I was asking them to, you know, create all these splintering noises and noises of um, bones and fragmentation. And as we went on through the process, it became clear that it's quite difficult to tour with things like bones, especially taking them across international borders. So um, we sort of negotiated and they uh, introduced me to a whole lot of instruments that I wasn't familiar with and a lot of sounds that they could make that I had never thought of. Uh, so it was a total collaboration around creating this spooky kind of spidery sound that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. What is that little instrument at the very beginning of the piece, the little one that makes yeah. that sound, that unique yeah. sound? What is that? I've never seen that before. Yeah, so that was one of the ones they taught me about. It's called a Wald Teufel. Uh, I think it's a bird caller, right? Maybe the guys can talk about it. They're um, little, uh, you, I, I've put a, a set of instructions on my website if you want to make one at home but it's a, a <laughs> tiny little cylinder um, and it makes this kind of creaking amazing noise um, and they're hard to buy so we had one I, I'd written one and then we had a our second workshop and it just was clear like all the other guys were standing there doing nothing and I thought well let's just have everyone playing wild toyful uh, so they had to make <laughs> three more of them uh, but they're a lot cheaper and a lot easier than finding bone instruments or splintering apart bamboo, which is what I had. And I think Peter almost took his eye out with some bamboo. <laughs> yeah, the Waldteufel is a German instrument. And guys, weigh in if, if uh, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I, it's uh, the translation is Forest Devil. Um, and uh, so it's uh it's a very simple instrument it's, it's basically a very small drum with a string through the head of the drum and the string is attached to both the drum head and a small uh wooden dowel that um creates friction which is translated through the string into the tiny drum head and it just creates this sound like a imaginary force devil or bones creaking or you know whatever your imagination will sort of <laughs> will, will take you. Um, and we did make a few, but I should tell you, Gemma, that we've now sourced uh, Vault Teufel, so we know where to get them. So uh, if any curious there listeners are, are out there, we could share the link. <laughs> you can get your own Vault Teufels. We have a large collection of Vault Teufels now. In our studio. Um, yeah, that was interesting. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say it was just kind of like a funny memory that I have uh, this this sort of sound world that Gemma was describing of like going first from bones and then we were messing with bamboo and finally came on ball teufels. And I remember us talking about like the idea of bones and like how many bones do we need for the piece and like how are we going to travel with bones and whatnot? <laughs> like where are we going to get the bones, you know, and like uh, and then I, I was I was I was I, I'm a dog geek. Uh, I, have, I have a dog who loves her beefy bones. And we have like tons of these old like bones right there. I'm like, well, at least my dog will be happy about this like process of like gathering all the bones necessary. But they never made it into the the piece, so so she'll get to eat her bones by herself. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of these instruments, um, and tie on the Braxton's bees, I was also amazed by the wood slacks. Right? Is that wood slacks? And then the metal slacks that you had in the piece. Can you talk about that particular instrument and have you worked with that instrument before is that how do you get to get that sound sure that um what claudia is talking about uh, in tayandi's piece they're stacked uh pieces of wood that are cut to different lengths and it's probably one of the most simple instruments that you can think of besides the human voice or just clapping or something it's just literally just a piece of wood and cutting it to a different length will change the pitch of the of the wood. And we had been working with another composer, uh, Chris Cerrone, to, to, to figure out if we could like save room on a table, because if you call for eight wooden slats, it takes up a lot of room. Uh, so I think Peter might have been the one who put foam between the wooden slats and tried to stack them like little size uh, skyscrapers of 
slats. And then a time they happened to come into the studio during a time when we had been set up to practice uh, Chris's piece. And he started playing it and just immediately used this new scraping technique down the wooden slats. And it, we were all, our heads all <laughs> turned and our eyes lit up and we're like, we've never heard that before. That's amazing. That sounds exactly like your, <laughs> exactly like the electronics that you use. And he's like, I know this is great. So it was, uh, it was a wonderful kind of um, just happenstance. And then the wood, uh, we have lots of raw materials like this that we have all over our studio, probably too much of it, but we, we love introducing composers to it because it, uh, it allows composers to write for exact pitches but with the sound world that is just unfamiliar. So uh, wooden slats are one of those things, but also we have uh, flat metal bars that are exactly what they sound like, just pieces of steel, also cut to uh, very specific lengths to create pitches. And Tayan, they used some of those in, in his piece as well. And, uh, and Gemma used uh, some of them also. I know Rob plays them uh, in Gemma's piece. And, we're, we're spreading the word about wooden slats and metal bars to anyone who will listen. <laughs> you've, you've talked about them as partial. I, I saw he says that they're meditative phrases, which is, is very interesting. But you, he talks about pitched and partially pitched instruments. What exactly is the difference there? Sure. Maybe I'll just I'll jump, jump in again. In, in Tandy's piece and also in Gemma's piece, we, we play other, other instruments that uh, we don't have a full chromatic set of. For example, we have these really beautiful uh, Korean wood blocks that are uh, gorgeous and carved out of one piece of solid wood. And they, they do have a pitch, but they're not used in that way. The, a composer wouldn't call for an exact pitch of that instrument. It's usually you have a, a few of them from small to large and they create a contour. So there's a lot of instruments, uh, a lot of percussion instruments that are called unpitched instruments, mainly because of how they're used and how composers treat them. Not, not so much that they don't have a pitch, because if you, if you get out of tuner, you could probably figure out exactly what pitch of a cymbal is or, or a snare drum. But um, mm. they're used, and to human ears, we don't immediately associate them with a melody. So you'll see those blocks in, in both Jalen's piece, Tyana's piece, and there's a beautiful close-up in Gemma's piece of Peter playing those, those blocks. Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, the visual elements are incredible. And there's one at the opening of, I think it's Jalen's piece where someone is blowing into a tube. What is that little instrument? Yeah, we use um, a melodica in the show, which is, um, I think I, I think that's probably what you're referring to. Although guys, let me know if there's some other thing that we're blowing into because who knows, we use so many strange things. Um, but the melodica is a, is an instrument that is essentially operating like a harmonica, except it has a keyboard, so you can um, oh. more easily uh, play chromatic melodies without true harmonica technique, <laughs> like, a, like an actual amazing harmonica player. Um, so that's used in uh, and actually uh, one of the Philip Glass arrangements that we perform in the Metamorphosis show, but it that instrument finds its way into some of our other repertoire as well. So not it's interesting also because it's um, it brings up uh, uh, an interesting question we get as percussionists. A melodica is something that you use air to activate the sound, and there's a keyboard, but it's not a piano. A piano is a percussion instrument because there are hammers inside the piano striking the strings. Um, so melodica is not technically a percussion instrument. However, we in Third Coast like to say that if you ask a percussionist to play an instrument and they say yes, that's a percussion instrument. Because <laughs> we play, you know, we play wind instruments, we play string instruments, but um, they're generally, of course, we're not going to like play a violin solo, <laughs> you know, or whatever. No one would want to hear that. Um, but um, if someone has a creative use of an instrument that doesn't immediately uh, fit neatly into the category of percussion instruments, for us, it's still an instrument that we can make music with. Fascinating. So, um, moving into the future, what's what's next for Third Coat? What do you have uh, coming for you all? Well, this afternoon, actually, we're workshopping a brand new piece. <laughs> 
by a wonderful composer named Missy Mazzoli. Um, she uh, has written us uh, a big new piece. We're looking forward, of course, to lots of live performances in person, with real audiences. Um, many of those performances will be the Metamorphosis show um, that are scheduled for sort of December through May um, all over the country and in, in um, several countries overseas as well. Um, and we have um, a brand new collaboration with an amazing duo called Flutronics, which is a, a duo of composers and uh, uh, flute players. Uh, Natalie Josham and Allison Loggins, and um, we're uh, collaboratively composing a piece with them. So lots of lots of fun new projects. And guys, I, I probably forgot something. If, so. if I may, I, I'd, I'd like to share with whoever's listening, because I'm sure there's people who create music listening to this conversation. Uh, Third Coast has a program called the Currents Creative Partnership, which is currently open and accepting applications to. Um, and it will still be open. Um, uh, when the Library of Congress concert airs. So if you're watching this uh, and you create music, it's a free to apply to program that Third Coast runs, where um, if you would like to create a piece with us over several workshops, you just share a sample of your music and answer, uh, answer a simple questionnaire and, and pitch us an idea for a piece. And uh, it's all free to apply to. And there's information about that at our website, www.thirdcoastprofession.com. And this season we're working on uh, two new projects uh, through that partnership with, with folks that we selected last year uh, who are amazing music creators, uh, Suzanne Kite and Machado Mijiga. Um, and one of their cool project that we're gonna be sort of workshopping uh, over the next year or so and, and premiere a little further down the line is a, a new piece by uh, composer Carlos Carrillo, uh, who's based uh, in Illinois. Uh, he's on faculty at the University of Illinois. So we're excited uh, for that as well. Excellent. Jay Lynn, what's what's next for you? What's coming up? Ooh, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very loaded question. No, um, I'm actually in, in the process of working on um, my finally get to I, I consider it my third album because, you know, autobiography was for was, you know, for Wayne. So this would be my third. This is my personal um, album that um this is, a, I guess, a great time to reveal it because um, <laughs> nobody knows except me, my label, and uh, my mother. But I'm going to in, call the my next album will be called um, Artificial Intention. So um, it is. <laughs> thank you, David. No, it's it's um, it's still in the process of, of developing. Um, but um, I just did the the second piece for it. It's called, um, it's Abnormal Restriction, which is uh, actually another title from Dark Energy that I use, but this it's called Abnormal Restriction, but it's called, in the parentheses, I called it the Molly Coddle. And the reason I call it the Molly Coddle is, um, you'll hear like kind of like as in the in the uh, in the the words that i chose to use just just kind of um i would say to not not to give it away but just the, the observations of, of 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 life and kind of like where we have where have, where we have kind of settled in to me from you know from my point of view just kind of in humanity like where we are right now so it's just it's just it's, it's just going to be It'll be very Jalen, <laughs> very, very me. I always research everything I do. So it's just, you know, it's it's still just evolving. So that's why I'm here right now. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate it. Good luck to <laughs> you on that project. Wonderful. Thank Gemma, you. tell us what's next for you. What's coming up? Um, I have a composer collective called Kinds of Kings um, with Shelley Washington and Maria Katsani. And we are writing... Um, a concerto for Eighth Blackbird based in Chicago and the Cincinnati Symphony, which is premiering, I think, in March next year. Uh, so that's that's exciting, but also really challenging because we have to write the piece together, the three of us, and we've never done that before. So it's a lot of playing telephone and sending each other snippets of music and then remixing them and turning them into our own voices and back again. 
Wonderful. Well, we want to thank you so much for your time, for sharing with us so many behind the scenes stories. It's been fantastic having this conversation with you all. We wish you so much success, many live performances. <laughs> we all want to be live, right? We miss our, our, our audiences. So we wish you many live concerts and so much success. And thank you so much for sharing your work with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank for you, your question from home. Tune in for Third Coast Percussion Metamorphosis on October 30th, 2021. See you in the yes. next one. Bye now.